Let's pray over the, um, the offering and, and the message. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and, and Lord, we thank you for this uh, offering. Thank you, Lord God, that we can bring it in with a good heart and assurance that we're prospering your kingdom. And Lord, we also thank you for this word. Thank you, Father God, that, that you said in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we thank you for continued uh, development of our faith, Lord God. Not just a natural faith, but mountain-moving supernatural faith. We thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And so we know the Bible says, and we'll read this verse here in a little bit, where there is no vision, the people perish. And I believe a lot of believers today, this is for believers here, here today. We're all believers, right? And, uh, but, you know, there's no, there's no um, vision. And so the people, they just sort of go by the wayside and they flounder around half in the world, half in the church. But if they could just get some good old fashioned uh, purpose and vision and passion, uh, I think that they'd want to conquer the world for the kingdom of God. I'll tell you what, they'd never be bored one day in their life again. And I tell you what, when you get in that kind of a flow, the things of the world will lose its appeal. There's nothing like operating in the passion of God. And so look at Isaiah 53, 6, and we'll start with that verse. The first verse will be the um, New Living Translation, Isaiah, Isaiah 53, 6. And, and as always, we'll go right to the Word of God. Every, every sermon should have the Word of God in it. Every sermon should be based off of what God says, not just what the pastor says. But, but we've got to look at what the Word says too, right? My job as a pastor is, is sort of like a lawyer. I'm the build a case for what we're saying, and I'm to build it uh, in the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit takes the anointing on my life and pushes this Word out to you, and, and, and the Word gets into your heart. Amen? And then when it, when, it leaves, when it leaves my voice, it's up to you and the Holy Spirit what happens from there. But I believe that the Holy Spirit will get it the whole way into your heart, into your understanding. And so it says, Isaiah 53, 6, All of us, like sheep, have strayed wandered away we have left god's path to follow our own yet the lord laid on him the sins of us all and we know the hymn is jesus right we all come from that same boat we all came right there i've heard many of your testimonies of how how you were wandering astray at one time but now um you, you um god found you right and you and you accepted that sacrifice of god's son and now you're born again and so God is spiritual, right? He is a spirit. And so a person, any person is natural, a natural being, until they are born again in their spirit by the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? And so before I got saved, I was natural, um, all natural. I'm still natural. I still have a body, right? I still have a natural mind. But there wasn't no spiritual component there because I wasn't born again. I wasn't touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. But now I am, right? And so since I am, and since you are, our minds are then renewed with what? The Word of God. That's how we renew our minds, right? And with the Word of God, we develop in our faith. There's too many Christians, they're not developing their, their faith. We, ha we have a part to play in that, don't we? The Bible says in Romans 12, it says, Renew your minds. Do not be conformed to the world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, whose job is that? Ours. I can't say, God, renew my mind and transform me. He's going to say, nope, I've done everything I'm going to do. I've already set my son. I've already caused you to be born again in the spirit. I've given you my word. You know, I, you have my spirit, you have to do it. You know, we have to look ourselves in the mirror and say sometimes, you know, we are accountable for what happens in our life. We are accountable. Instead of maybe sometimes people blame other people or blame circumstances. I don't want to be someone that blames something from the past to how I am today. The past is the past. I'm talking about today. Amen. I'm talking about a new life. We don't want to go through life as a victim. Do we? You know, there's, there is, if you've been a victim in life, there is a mourning and there is a healing process, but come on, you got to like rise up from that because you serve a God that says he gives you beauty for ashes. 
you got to rise up and say, no more am I a victim. I'm a victor. And you know what? That devil that tried to destroy my life, I'm going to honor God and I'm going I'm to rescue people out of that same darkness he tried to take my life out with. You've got to have that kind of um, mindset with you, right? And so look at um, 1 Corinthians 2.14. This is the amplified version. And so this is the verse that just goes with what I said about there's a natural side of us, natural side of people, then there's a supernatural. Like right now, I mean, pa Paul definitely distinguished Christians from non-Christians. He definitely said they're, they're natural and, and they're, they're mere human uh, flesh. And he said that the born-again believers were supernatural in their spirit, children of God. So there's a difference, right? Now, we all, like I said, we all still have a body. We're, we're not aliens. We don't have five eyes growing out of our heads now or, you know, but man inside, we're not the same as a lost sinner, are we? They're lost in sin. We've been rescued from sin. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's something to shout about. Amen. Amen. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Yeah. The Bible says that we are right now, even though we're here in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, 2024, are we have a citizenship in heaven. If you check the roles in heaven, we're a citizen. Amen. All you got to do is ask Jesus. And he said, yeah, they're mine. <laughs> right? He, he, he runs the whole place. But look at 1 Corinthians 2.14. Amplified. It says, but the natural unbelieving man does not accept the things meaning the teachings and revelations of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness, foolishness, absurd and illogical to him. And he is incapable of understanding them because they are spiritually discerned and appreciated. And he is unqualified to judge spiritual matters. A person that's not born again cannot really rightly de de judge spiritual matters. The, the Bible clearly says it, right? You know, if, if someone brings them the word, the Holy Spirit will be there with the word, and the Holy Spirit will open them up to who Jesus is. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And if they accept Jesus, then they'll be able to discern further spiritual things. And so, you know, I, I often use this about, as an example about the abortion issue. Abortion issue is one of those things that's torn this country apart. And so we have to understand, though, as believers, that abortion issue should be settled. If you're spiritually discerning what the Word of God says and what the heart of God is, there, you should not be for taking an innocent life. Amen? Amen? You just should not be. And I know you could probably, there's probably some other pastors out there say, yeah. Well, well, you, you know, they can or they should. Well, I beg to differ. I've been at this a long time. I, I know the Holy Spirit. I know what the Word says. And God is for life. Amen. He wouldn't put those children in, those womb, in the mother's womb to have them sucked out of the womb. Right? He just wouldn't do it. But at the same time, we... we we can't be cold and callous about it. We've got to realize that people get in tough situations that young ladies do. And so there needs to be a lot of love and a lot of uh, um, mercy for these people and a lot of help. And so um, we can't be so rigid that we don't love people, right? But I'm just talking particularly for the church, right? Now, I'm not, talk I'm not even talking to the world because they're not going to understand or not even be convinced it, it, on, on a spiritual level. But there are some people that aren't born again that, that, that aren't for like abortion and things like that. But, but every born again believer. And you know what they should do then? On November 5th, march themselves right over to the voting, voting booth. You can be a one, one um, topic or one subject uh, voter. Abortion can be that. Because the, the alarming rate that these babies are being killed in our country, it, it's, it's barbaric. 
And they don't stop at first trimester. They don't stop at third. They, they, don't, they don't stop at second or third. They do. There are seven states that allow for a baby to be killed after it's born in a botched abortion. Seven states. I, I can't sign off on that. And I don't think God would either, right? And so, but the problem is there's a lot of Christians, they're carnal. And they've never learned to respect pastors. They never learned to respect churches. And so they just do what they want to do and think how they want to think and, and got their own silly version of what God's like. They've never grown. They've never grown spiritually. Well, that's not us, right? And so look at Jeremiah 29, 11. You all know this one. Most of you know this one, New King James. So we're talking about where there is no vision, the people perish. And so we've got to know, first of all, we've got to know that God is the one that has a plan for us. We had talked Sunday, what is the meaning of life? God is, right? Where do we come from? We came from God. For what? To bring him glory. So a life lived for God and pleasing to God is the meaning of life. Nothing else matters. You get that in, in play first, and then all the other blessings follow. And then you become, uh, Lord willing, if that's something you want, you become a, a godly mother or a godly father or a godly wife, godly husband or a godly church person, and, and you, you, you bless the world with the love of God. But our first meaning of life is to honor God. Look at Jeremiah 29, 11. God says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, I want to read to you a faith concept here. And so this first faith concept that I'm going to read goes like this. With the plan of God for your life comes a complete provision. If God's called you in life to do something or to fulfill something, there's provision that comes with it. If you are following God's plan, you don't have to ask him to bless it. It's already blessed, Amen. right? But what we should not do is make our own plans and ask God to bless our plans. Well, he's not going to bless it if it doesn't line up with his plan, right? Just because it's not apparent, this provision is just because this provision is not apparent to you doesn't mean that it's not there. You know, sometimes you can feel like, boy, I have a lot of lack, I have a lot of needs, and and so even though it, it doesn't seem apparent, it does not mean that it's not there. Just because it's not at the moment visible doesn't mean that you don't have it. You have it. It's faith that receives what God has already provided. And it's faith that causes or enables God to bring it from the invisible to the visible, or to bring it from the spiritual to the natural. How do we get that process? It's faith. Amen? And so just, just that's why we say we're not moved by what we see, we're not moved by what we feel, we're only moved by what God's Word says. God's Word is God's promise. And so this visible, natural realm must come into line with what God says. The only way this natural, visual realm comes in line with what God says is through the Word and the Spirit. Amen? You've got to train your mind on the Word, and you've got to follow the Spirit. And so as we move ahead in faith, this visible, natural realm starts changing. Amen? The natural things are always subject to change. The truth of God's word never changes, right? And so as we begin to move ahead in faith, this visible natural realm will change. Now, when God leads us in a direction, it's because there is supply waiting for us when we obey him. All the supply and all the provision is, is, is when we go to where he calls us to be or along the journey. You get outside of the, God's perfect will and get into the permissive will, there's no supply out there. There's no provision out there. You're on your own, right? Mm -hmm. God cannot bless a plan that's not his plan. If you're not on God's perfect will, you're, you're in the permissive will. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a rebellion, right? 
Sometimes it's in ignorance, but, but wherever it is, we need to ask God what he says about things. You'd be surprised how many times people make big decisions and they don't even ask God. I've had so many people tell me over the years, husband might say, you know what? Um, uh, I'm leaving my wife. She's no good. And, and, and she don't understand me. Don't temper tantrums. You know. She's good. And she understands him. And uh, most of the time. And, I mean, they got their plans all set. And then I said, well, this always gets them too. I said, well, did you ask God what he thought about that plan? You're like, no. Well, maybe you should. In fact, you don't even have to ask him. I'll tell you what he says. <laughs> I'll tell you what the word says. Right? And so you're not going to know God's plan or how to follow God's plan if you don't know what the word says. You know, some time ago we had these bracelets that said, what, what's the word say on them? Remember that? And, uh, you know, there used to be um, the bracelets at WWJD, what would Jesus do? But I thought, you know, I don't really know about that bracelet because most people don't even know what Jesus would do. They might think Jesus would punch somebody in the nose if they deserved it. I don't know. But the Bible says they reject the word of God. They make up foolish ideas of what God's like. But if you say, what's the word say? Now you got them locked in where they need to be locked in, right? And so there's a saying that says, who God calls, he equips. You know, and so we have to remember that. that as we're following God's will, he'll, he'll get you through whatever you're going through. As a church, as a people, right? This isn't my church. This is God's church. Amen. This, this is, we've been all called together as brothers and sisters to take care of this house and to let our light shine and to bring them in, build them up and make them wise. We've been called by God together. And so, and so God equips us. He supplies our every need, does he not? And so look at uh, Proverbs 29, 18. Still building a case in the Word of God, Proverbs 29, 18. You know, one of the best ways of getting in God's will and staying there is stop doing things contrary to the Word. That's the best way. Amen? So if God says you, you love one another, then that's what you do. If God says you forgive people, then that's what you do. If you have issues with it, which sometimes if people have been hurt real bad, it's hard to forgive, you pray and ask God to give you the strength because he will. But then you've got to do what he says to do. You know what he says to do about people that have hurt you? He says pray for them. Why? Remember, you're not a natural person. If you tell a natural person to pray for somebody that hurt them, they're, they're going to get mad or they're going to think you're crazy. It's going to be absurd to them. But it shouldn't be absurd to you because Jesus did that to you. We have that understanding. And so when people hurt us or, or mistreat us, the Bible says we are to pray for them because that supernatural spirit of God in you and that supernatural spirit in there is everything you need, the supply and the ability to forgive that person. And God will supernaturally give it to you from, from, from the kingdom of God within you, right? If you wait till you feel like praying for somebody that's hurt you, that might not ever happen. You'll be like, tomorrow, tomorrow, maybe next, maybe the next, maybe next year, <laughs> right? What's procrastination? The thief of all blessings. Amen. I'm glad. I'm just so glad when I asked Jesus to forgive me, he didn't say tomorrow. And I'm so glad he didn't say, maybe next year. Let me see a little bit more from you first. He forgave me right on the spot. Amen. Amen. And that's our Lord. And that's our Father. And the apple should not fall far from the tree. We're children of God and we should be just like him. And Proverbs 29, 19, 18, it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keep the law or the word of God, happy is he or she. 
And so if there's no vision, you're perishing, right? But if you keep the word of God in, in your eyes and in your heart and, and, and have a heart to, to be obedient to what God says, how many know if you're going to be obedient to what God says, it's going to hurt your flesh? It's not going to like wound you, like break your bone or anything, but it's going to be hard on the flesh because the flesh wants what it wants right now. The flesh doesn't care about tomorrow or who it hurts. The flesh says, just gratify me right now. But that's not the way to go. That's the wrong road. And you know, I'm not, I'm not joking about it. I'm telling you what the word says. That's the wrong road. Amen? So it's going to hurt a little bit. And it's going to be like, oh, man. It's just like your parents when... When you say, you asked if you could go spend the night at a friend's house, and, 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 and they're like, no. I've never been big on those sleepovers. Anyway. And so, but they say, no. You say, well, it hurts, it hurts the flesh a little bit, right, when they hear no, the kids. And they'll say, well, so-and-so's parents, let them go. I'm not their yeah, they say, well, I'm not so-and-so's parents. Yeah. Then you got to look them right in the eye. You can't be too hard on them, though, because the Bible says don't, don't provoke them to anger. You shouldn't, even, you shouldn't even discipline your child unless you, 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 are, you are doing it in love. Amen? And I'm talking about correction and things like that. The, the, it, um, uh, the Bible does say spare the rod, spoil the child, but that's a special occasion. That doesn't mean you beat your kid all over the place. Right? You got, you got to pray about those things, right? And, and, and probably the, the, the younger ones need a little pat on the butt probably. You know, they got a diaper on, they don't feel it anyway. <laughs> but, but the older they get, it's probably, it's probably, it's, it's nearly non-existent. That's what I think, right? And so, but God gives parents wisdoms and what, the, wisdom and how to raise their children. But, you know, you got to look your child in the face and say, look, I love you, but I'm going to be your parent first. Not trying to be your best friend, but I guarantee you one thing, your best friends will never love you as much as I love you. And I got a responsibility to raise you in the way of the Lord and to keep you safe, and that's what I'm doing. Amen? And they might grumble a little bit, but you know what? When they get older like me, I'm 59, when they get older like me, they'll look back on it and say, like I say, I'm thankful for everything that my parents did for me. I'm thankful that they kept me out of trouble. I'm thankful that, that I had a dad that wouldn't, wouldn't let none of that nonsense go. And, and, and today, you know, it, it's, it's probably preserved my life. And so children need their parents, do they not? And so it says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keep the law happy is he. You know what vision means? It means revelation. So the Amplified Bible says it this way. Where there is no vision, meaning no revelation of God and his word, the people are unrestrained. It doesn't mean a vision like, oh, you know, all the angels come out, and I got a vision of this great thing. You know, it doesn't mean that. It means, it means what it says here, the revelation of God and his word. If there's none of that, people are perishing. And you know they are, right before our eyes. And we got people in high places. We are literally watching them perishing as they go on this, this journey in high places. You're watching them perish. There's no wisdom, is there? There's no word of God. And like I said, it always comes back to the kid. You don't put, you don't put uh, litter boxes in, in, in kids' restrooms. Because they say they're a cat. No vision there of God, a revelation of his word, right? This animalistic, carnal nature stuff. I saw a guy one time, who was it? Uh, or I don't know if it was a movie or something, but they, uh, they were. Oh, it was that movie where um, they, they um, this one town adopted all those kids. Did you see that? Um, there was a black family and they adopted this, this pastor and his wife started adopting children and then the whole town just adopted children. It was, it's a good movie. I forget the name of it. It was a good movie. But um, they adopted this girl and she's like, shh, shh, 
was like, she's a cat. Psst. True story. Like 13, 14 years old and, and making all these. And he said, okay, go on outside, Dad. If you're a cat. And then when everybody else sat down at the table, he, he, he gave her cat food. That's what cats eat. She got over that in, in a quick minute. That's wisdom, right? Wisdom. It's, it's, it's vision. And so we're not perishing. If our children or grandchildren say, I'm a cat, you're going to say, no, you're not. If you're a cat, go ahead and eat that cat food. Right? <laughs> they just need some guidance, that's all. They don't need enablers. Right? But you got to watch that devil because if he can, he'll, he'll, he'll get the children. Amen. Amen. Because a lot of adults don't have any, any, no vision, no revelation of God and his word. And so they're perishing right in front of us. And they're bringing a lot of people down with them because Jesus said the blind lead the blind and they all fall into the ditch. Amen. And so we need the word, don't we? Amen. On a continual basis. The word is your spiritual food. When I was at um, Rama out in Oklahoma, I volunteered to, to help out in a nursing home. I did that for a couple years. Um, I think it was one Saturday a month. And, uh, um, you know, we, they did it like we do. You know, we, we'll talk to the residents. You get to know them. And after a while, I became pretty good friends with this older lady in there, one of the residents. And just... Um, she, did, she didn't have anybody. I felt sorry for her. Just wanted to be a friend and help her. And I noticed she didn't have a Bible. So I asked our, my, my team leader, Barbara, I said, is it okay if I buy her a Bible? And, um, and um, she said, yeah, you can do it. So I thought, well, I better ask the lady first. And so I was talking to her. I said, is it okay if I buy you a Bible? And uh, she said, oh, I read that book years ago. <laughs> I read that book years ago. That's like saying I ate 500 days ago, I don't need to eat anymore. You know, you need to eat every day, right? And so we don't want to have that mindset, right? The Bible isn't a book or a novel like Moby Dick or something. It's the living word of God. It's the incorrupt, incorruptible seed. Do you believe about when the Bible says that? What I'm giving you tonight is the incorruptible seed of the word of God. The same seed that caused you to be born again when you heard that word. And so you were born again in the spirit, but you can, you can have all kinds of miracles if you get that word deep down, deep down in your spirit and you learn to speak it and walk in it, right? Mm -hmm. And so vision comes first. And then when the vision comes, the passion comes. And so, but the vision, like I said, comes, the godly vision comes when you're spending time with God. Amen? Spending time in his word, spending time in God things like you're doing tonight. This is the God thing, right? You know, it comes that way. Same way Nehemiah went to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. You know how he got that vision that created a purpose and then a passion? He, re he rebuilt those walls in Jerusalem. He was over in, in Babylon at the king's table. He was the cupbearer. He had a cushy life. But he heard about the condition of the Jews in his homeland, and it broke his heart. And before he did anything, he prayed and he fasted. And out of that prayer and fasting came a vision of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, going back to his homeland. That gave him purpose, and he did it with the passion of God, and they rebuilt that wall. And when they re rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, guess what happened? The people came home because they had a place to come home to. And so that's how the visions get started, right? So rule number one for a Christian is never make God number two in your life. Or don't put him in second place. Because he can't work if he's, if he's in second place, right? Amen. He's God. He has to, in order for him to work, he has to be first. Because whatever you're putting for, first, you, that, that is what you're relying on to supply your needs. And, and you know what? Nothing can supply your needs like God can. 
You can't even put your husband or wife first in your life. You got to put God first. But you know what? It'll make you a better husband and a better wife. It's not that you run off to the missionary field and leave your wife behind. I'm not saying that. But, but you can't put all that re- pressure and responsibility on your spouse to give you what only God can give you. You've got to spend your time in prayer. You've got to read the Word. You've got to put God first. And as you follow God's Word, husbands, you'll follow and, and, and be obedient to when the Word says that, that you love your wife as Christ loved the church. Amen? See how it works? But so many people put other things before God. So allow God's timing also when he's directing your path. You know, the Bible says, let patience have its perfect work. One thing the devil tries to do, he tries to push people out ahead of God's plan. It's it's the right plan sometimes. It's it's the right, it's okay when God's in on it. But but timing is everything. And sometimes people go too fast. And sometimes people go too slow. Who's going to help you with that? God spending time in prayer, right? Oprah's not going to help you with that. Dr. Phil or no one like that on TV, God helps you with that. Do you believe that? And so it's like when when God called me to go to Ramah, I knew the timing was, was now. I knew that timing was now, and, if, and I knew this, that if I, would, if I would delay it for like a year, sometimes the temptation is when you're making a big move like that, is to go ahead and delay it a little bit and think things out. That's a good move if that's what God says. But sometimes he says, go, go now. I know in my case, if I would have delayed it, I might not have ever gone. A whole year, a lot can happen, right? And so... But how, how did I know God's timing? He put it in here. How did he put that vision in there of going to Ramah and the purpose and the passion of being a pastor? How did he put that in there? I spent time in prayer seeking his will and asking him who it is that he made me to be. That's what I did. And then same, same way with Nehemiah. There came the vision. There came the purpose. And you know what? A true vision, a true purpose, a true passion never leaves. It's just as strong in me today as it was some 23 years ago. It's the same. It's the same in here. It's the same fire. It's the same strength. It's the same courage. It's the same comfort that it was when he told me back on, on Wolf Avenue in my bedroom when I was praying, right? So here's what you gotta do. You know, first of all, Let me say this statement. The man who walks with God will always reach their destination. Did you ever hear anybody say, man, I walked with God faithfully and I didn't get there? No, that don't happen, right? And and understand this. Everyone has baggage. But when you walk with God, you know what he does? He'll help you unpack. That's why when you marry somebody you got to realize that everybody brings baggage into a marriage. You better marry somebody that's going to help you unpack that baggage. Amen? And not hit you over the head with the suitcase. (laughs) Right? And so so here's what you do about your past. you got to let go of your past to find your God-given destiny. Don't let your past define you or limit you. The only thing you can do about your past is repent, right? Get forgiveness, make amends where necessary, and then move on in your new identity of who you are in Christ. And then you can truly say, that old person's dead. That person doesn't even exist no more. I'm a brand new person person i've already got it under the blood i've already made amends and now i'm walking forward i'm not looking back i'm putting my hands on the plow and in that past will not not define me in any way who i am in christ defines me that's what god wants us to do so another faith concept that i want to bring to you is that for the believer our god-given destiny is not a matter of chance but a matter of choice In other words, when God gives you the destiny or the vision, 
you getting there isn't a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice, right? Our destiny is determined by the decisions that we make and the wisdom that we follow. Amen? You know, my journey as a pastor was not a matter of chance, but it was a matter of choice. Once God put it in my heart, I had to rent the U-Haul. I had to get the whole family together. They packed that thing so tight. I mean, when you open the door, you just had to run because you thought everything was going to fall out. I had to drive 1,200 miles across the country, single parent with four children, not, think, not feeling anything like a pastor, but all I had was the, was, the, was the passion in here. The purpose that came from the vision of, of God touching my life. One word from God can change your life forever. Amen. Amen. But I had to make choices. And, and when, I, when I got there, you know, and there's financial trouble, and, there, and there's, there's, there's people sometimes that don't act right, and I got all this pressure of raising four children, trying to go to school, trying to, trying to make a living, trying to just make things work. I had to trust God. I had a choice. I could trust God or go back home. But to tell you the truth, when God puts that passion in here, there was nothing going to make me quit. And there's nothing going to make me quit now. You know, I'll be here as long as God wants me here. And then if he moves me somewhere, at least I'm getting touched by God. I'm still getting touched, right? <laughs> but until I hear, I'm going to say, God, I, I, I'm, you know, my military days, Private Poe reporting to duty. Actually, I was a specialist because I had a couple years of college, so I was only a private for a short time. <laughs> right? So I'm reporting the duty every day. God, I'm in your will. Amen? And so it makes a difference when you know that God's approving and it's God's plan. And so a lot of Christians have the perspective of, you know, I'm just going to survive. God doesn't want us to just survive. He wants us to thrive. Now, I'm running out of time. Where I can give you tons of scriptures that proves that point. But I'll give you one scripture. Don't turn there, though. Romans 8, 37 says, We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Are you conquering? Or do you see yourself as a victim? Or do you see yourselves as not, not being worthy? Some, some Christians, they still don't see themselves as worthy. That, that needs to be um, gotten out of them. And I try, that's why I try to be so transparent because you know what? None of us are worthy. You think I'm worthy on my own to stand up in front of you and give you the word of God? Do you think that, that I did anything that made me worthy of that? Jesus makes me worthy. Amen. Amen? And he makes you worthy. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But that should keep us humble. And that should keep us to a place where we don't forget where we came from. You know, we, we can't make it about ourselves. We have to make it about God in everything that we do, right? And so we have to change how we see ourselves. And, and, I'll, and I'll end with this story. When I was at Rama, um, this one Rama instructor told us about a time when his kids were small. Him and his wife went on a two-week missions trip. And he, so he sent his two sons Cody and Mitchell to their grandparents' house. And they get there to their grandparents' house, and they're like out west, and, and they, they like to go to rodeos, right? And these kids found something brand new. It was called mutton busting. Did you ever hear of that? Mutton busting. Where the kids ride the sheep <laughs> for the rodeo. Mutton busting. And, uh, and so, um, so he had two children, Colt. Cody was the oldest at child at 11, and Mitchell was younger. He, he was nine, and so they stayed at their grandparents for two weeks. And so I'm going to just read to you what, what he had said to us one day in, in class. He said, you know, we, after a few days, we called to check in with the kids, and, and Mitchell was so excited because Cody got sixth place, and he got eighth place in the mutton busting rodeo. And Mitchell said, next time... The nine-year-old said, next time, Cody, who was the 11-year-old, he said, next time, Cody is going to get first, and I'm going to get second. And, and his dad said, that didn't sound right to me. 
He said, so I said, Mitchell, you can get first place next time. And he said, when he said that, he said there was a long silence on the other end of the phone. And then he heard this real small voice from Mitchell saying, I, I can get first place. I can beat Cody. And so he picked up what his dad was putting down, right? And so, um, so he called back a few days later, and Mitchell got on the phone, and he was all excited. Guess what? He won first place. And, uh, but this instructor said, he said, I wanted, wanted to change my son's perspective on how he sees himself. Just because Cody was older, bigger, and stronger did not mean that he had to settle for second place. This changed Mitchell's perspective on life. This is what his dad said. It changed his whole outlook on life, his whole perspective. Mitchell went on to be a winner, he said. His college football coach said that even though Mitchell was undersized and not as fast as some of the other players at his position, he was a winner. He was an overachiever, and he said we couldn't keep him off the field. That guy believed in himself. And so we need to have that same belief, right? Yep. This is what the Bible says. The, the Bible is like a mirror that reflects not what's on the outside of a person. It reflects what's on the inside of a person. It shows you what you're made of and teaches you to react beyond how you feel. The Word of God is the incorruptible seed that when implanted in the fertile ground of our hearts, it gives us the ability to have faith over negative feelings such as fear and anxiety. So with the Word of God, it goes to the inside of who we are, and it produces an image in us that is one of victory, one of king's kids. It produces an image in us of the promises of God, and it blows those negative feelings of fear and anxiety and insecurities. It blows them out of the water because the Word of God gets us inside. Amen? Amen. That's why we need, to, um, we need to get the Word in us. Don't turn it, but I'm going to read to you what James 1 says, 22. It says, don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. That's James 1, through 25. And so do you, do you remember when David f defeated Goliath? He was just a young teenager, right? What was everyone else doing? Hiding from, from, the, from the giant. What did David say to the, giant, to the giant? He said, this day, God will deliver you into my hand. Amen? He spoke faith. He had an image on the inside of him from the word of God that, that as a child, they were, they were required to memorize and to know the first five books of the Bible. They had to know it completely. He knew. And plus, he already defeated the lion and the bear, right? And Joshua and Caleb, remember when Moses sent out the 12 tribes? And, and, and 10 of them came back and said, we can't do it. Them some giants over there. And we, we, can't get, we can't get it. We can't get it. 10 of them said we can't get it. But two of them, Joshua and Caleb, had a different image, right? What did they say? They said, let us go once, at once, immediately, and possess the land. For the battle belongs to the Lord. Amen. And so what are you going to say when, when you face the giants in your life? What's going to come out of your mouth? Are you going to have the grasshopper syndrome? Like the ten spies that said, oh, we're just grasshoppers in their sight? Or are you going to rise up? Here, here's where I'd love you to be to say, there's no giants in this world. I'm the giant. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So that makes me the giant. I like to play with the grandkids. They go, they go to the, um, to the uh, um, playground and, you know, in that place where they go down the slide and run around in there. And I always say, I'm the giant. I'm the giant. I chase them around. They run and scream and things like that, you know. And I try to grab their foot. And uh, I did it with my kids. I do it with my grandkids now, <laughs> you know. And so, but naturally speaking, you run from a giant. 
But I'm not speaking naturally. You know? Uh, I'm just a mere human being. I'm five foot ten, and I'm not going to tell you how much I weigh, but. <laughs> well, by faith, 180. <laughs> I'm not lying, I said by faith one day. <laughs> you know, I'm 59 years of age. I can't do what I could do when I was 20, a, a lot of things. But that don't mean I'm not a giant. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Victory is mine. So what are you going to say when those, when those, use air quotes, giants come into your life? You know what you're going to say? Whatever, whatever you put in your heart from the word of God and whatever you meditated on and whatever you dwelt on and whatever you spent time in the presence of God building inside of you, that will determine how you respond. The word of God's powerful. You know, uh, Andrew Womack, he said he spent like six months just reading about the life of Jesus, reading about all the miracles that he did. And we know Jesus rose the dead, right? I mean, he just spent just over and over again reading about these miracles. So one day him and his wife were going on a trip and they get a phone call and they're not that far away, but they're, they're a couple hours. And, and it, was, it was one son talking about their other son, their younger son. They said he was in an accident and he's dead. Their son died. And he said, well, don't let anybody touch the body till we get there. They turned the car around. He went into the morgue and raised his son from the dead. And you know why he said he could do it? He said it was easy because I just spent six months or however long it was reading about the life of Jesus. That's what Jesus did. He put a whole image in him, a whole power, victory in him that was greater than even death. All that stuff's available to you. But you have to yield yourself and humble yourself and, and, and apply yourself. And God's word works. Amen. That's all I have. Would you rise, please? Thank you for coming out. Okay, let's pray. Father, we come to the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for these wonderful people that came out this evening. And now, Lord, I just thank you for um, keeping them safe. I thank you for watching over them and their children. And Lord, before I let them go, I just, want, I just uh, praise you and thank you for meeting those prayer requests tonight, Lord. And Lord, I give you glory for the, for the uh, testimonies. But Lord, I thank you that lives are changing. Lives are changing because you have a people that believe you and will stand in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.